Saving yourself from the passion you're about to put into listening here. I know it's exciting, but uh, you know. And that, that means you lot at the back too. Either goodbye or, you know, come closer, because this is good. This is going to be fantastic. So over to these two guys. And, um, yeah, great. Okay. Good evening. My name is Kimbo Sorak. I'm from, from Migo Touch Input Methods Framework. Here is Mohamed Anwari. We are here to speak about Input Methods Framework's architecture and how to m configure the m virtual keyboard for your liking. So first, I think Mohamed will start and give, us, give you a good, represent, good presentation about the architecture. Okay, thank you, Kimmo. Um, yeah. Before I start, I, 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 I really like to know the audience first. So how many of you are familiar with the input methods? Okay, that's good. How many of you are actually developing input methods? Okay, we have a few. All right, uh, so this is all about the Migo Touch input method frameworks. It's featured in the handheld UX of the Migo. Basically, it provides the text input services. Um, well, it pro it's not meant to be for uh, navigations. So it's mainly for inputting text. Um, it supports, uh, uh, at least theoretically, multiple UI framework. And it has the client server model of the architecture. And it's highly customizable and extendable. And it makes you, as a developer, to make it easy to, to integrate your platform with these frameworks. Um, I just got a new netbook and I installed the the Migo netbook edition there and I found the input method from Migo Touch running there. That's awesome. Okay, the frameworks. So we have a two part of frameworks. Um, the first one is the input method UI framework. As you can see it in green box here. So it it, it hosts the user interface, so this is where the actual visual um, input method UI is, 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 is appearing and it interacts with the rest of the platform components. The, the next one is about the engine, so it, it abstracts the input method engine's API, which is usually uh, proprietary. So with these two frameworks, we, we have this Migo Touch input method framework. So let's talk about the UI framework first, um, the highlights. So we select or load the input method UI as a plugin, and they are loaded based on the categories, uh, which basically is the, like, uh, what, what the plugin can, can do. And we have basically three categories at the moment. The first one, the hardware keyboard, which is automatically activated when your hardware keyboard is, is, is opened. And the next one is the own screen, which is actually the uh, basically like virtual keyboard and writing recognitions, anything that you see on the screen that you can interact it with. Next one is accessories. It's about the external or foreign input method devices, like for example, Bluetooth pen, Bluetooth keyboard, something like that. And they are activated by the frameworks. Uh, now the, this one we depend on the context kit provider. And this one we, uh, these two, we control that by using GCon. And for the framework itself, we use the common text input paradigm. So we don't, we don't send, uh, each key presses or each key releases events, but we instead use pre-edit and, 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 and committed strings there. Well, we do actually can do the uh, button press and button release, but we don't promote that, that, that mechanism, but we in favor in this, this pre-edit and committed string instead. And we have default plugin available, which is the Migo keyboard. It's the full feature. Well, not really full-featured, but 
but uh, most of the features are there in Mikitorios. It's uh, Kim will talk about that in details after this. And the, we have this uh, framework um, as well as the MIGU keyboard in in, in Mikitorios as LGPL. And here the brief. Uh, illustration of the components inside the UI framework. So on the top here, we have input context of the UI framework, which is basically what you need to do to integrate w with, the, with the UI framework used in the platform. And it handles the text input operation on the text input side, on the, oh, sorry, on the text entry side. It's about text editing, cut, copy, paste, entering text, pre-edit, committed text, also widget relocations. For example, in virtual keyboard case, you don't want the uh, text entry being hidden or obscured by, by, by the virtual keyboard. So you need to do that in, 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 in the text uh, entry side, which is the UI framework. In Migo Touch, we use the Migo input context on the framework side, and on the Migo Touch side, we have this Migo input method state which basically holds all the information needed by those text entries operations. Next one is the input context connections here, which is basically handles the data transportation to and fro the uh, input context of the text entry side and the input method server. And in Miko that we use the bus. In Migo 1.1, we still use session dbus, and 1.2 will change that to private dbus for security reason. Next one is a windowing and input system component, which is basically uh, one of the other integration part of the platform. It displays the whole UI. It handles the input, both hardware and, and, and from the hardware keyboard from, and also from the touch screen. So in, in Migo Touch we used X11 for, for, for this, this uh, purpose, which uh, basically XKB for hardware keyboard and X fixes for the virtual keyboard. So it, it will allow you to pass through all the events from, from the, uh, like uh, in Migo Touch, if you see virtual keyboard, basically you see the whole screen is owned by virtual keyboard, but you can still interact with the application beneath virtual keyboard by using X fixes. So we put a hole there inside the UI. Next one is about the plugin loaders. Basically, it handles all the plugin, uh, the UI plugins. So in, in Mega Touch framework, we load at the moment only, I'm sorry, only the uh, M widget at the moment. Next one is settings which basically displays the UI settings. And at, at, so the user can choose which input methods he wants, which language that he wants to, to use. And in Migo Touch, we use the Migo control panel interface. Uh, so basically, th this you can like take and, 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 and use and adjust with your own platform. If you use different technologies, if you use different architecture, you can use still like customize inside this, which we try to be mo modularized, but uh, in some few places we still have like uh, inside the code, so it's not really compilations options, but we, we aim for that. Next one is about the uh, fr engine framework. It's a pure QT, so it's, it doesn't depend on Migo Touch. It abstracts the input method engines API, which I mentioned earlier, usually proprietary, but uh, of course this can be extended to, to also cover the open source engines as well. It's also a plugin system inside that, and it doesn't depend on any input method UI. So if you develop your own input method plugin, you don't need to use this if you want, but, if, but of course if you want to use the already existing engine, then you can also take this. And also, it's LGPL also available in, in Qtorius. Uh, here are the interfaces provided at the moment. We have the uh, interface called Words. It basically provides you error corrections, error uh, word predictions, word completions. The next one, which is 
there is a merge request in Gitorious, we have this handwriting recognition interface. So this is, in the end of the day, you, you, this is the diagram that, that uh, basically will, will look like on, on, your, on the platform. So you will have your plugin here, plugin here, and your engine here, your engine there, they all work like this. So it, this is the process boundaries, and this is, and at the bottom part, this uh, is the input method UI server running in the background, and at top, this is application, so they are living in different processes. So in MIGO 1.2, in UI framework, we will have a new plugin category, so we already have three, and we, we add one more voice input. Um, so basically, uh, the idea would be put some 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 means to activate that. I'm not sure how. It depends. What is what's your what's your opinion on that? And we have a new information exposures, the anchor and cursor position, which is not yet exposed. But uh, we had uh, feedbacks from from input method developers that they need this. And uh, next things about moving to private debugs, as I mentioned earlier. On the engine framework side, we will have new functions in words interface, which basically supports or enables the uh, dynamic virtual keyboard uh, changing at the runtime. time. And also, as I mentioned, there is new interface being cooked at the moment, which is handwriting recognition. And beyond 1.2, this is what we aim for that we, need, uh, we want to be closer to QT, meaning that uh, we don't want to, to, to be able only for MIGO touch, but we want also to be able to load, for example, QMLs or any other plugins. Then also display size, scalability. Yeah, during the first keynote, I, I saw the this MIGO tablet. That's very cool. I think we need to support that, but if you run current MIGO touch, Keyboard there, I don't think that's really usable, so we need to, to handle this case as well. So we, we want to expose the input method widgets that we are working on now, like the keyboard, to be available uh, from, from other plugins. So I think this is my part. Do you have any questions for this part? Or so do you move? Okay. Uh, it's not about uh, to, uh, it's not in one dot two, but beyond that, I've, I've heard one dot two. Yeah, we, we we plan for that, but if you already have the patch, so it's welcome now. Of course. Any other questions? Uh, no, that's basically the other way around. So we want to support like plain QT plugins, plain QML plugins. For the engine, we don't have that at the moment, but for, for the uh, UI framework, yes. The Migo keyboard is the example. So specifically to engine plugin, we don't have the plans. No. 
But we do have unit tests which you can take a look at if you want. That's true, but, but if you see the, the code of the uh, engine framework, it's quite straightforward. So I think that's, if you're uh, developing input methods, that I think you are really familiar with, with those interfaces because it's only a thin wrapper to the engine. Yes? Um, I was talking about the interface of the handwriting recognition, so it's not the implementations. Yes, it will be a little bit cheaper. Yes. Okay, I think I'm game more can take the stage now. See if this works too. That's some pointer. Keys. Okay, so my name is Kimo Zurakka. I also work in the virtual keyboard team where we are trying to make the best available general purpose virtual keyboard out there. So currently we have a tough competition. Anybody who has seen iPhone lately knows what we are aiming to better for. And one way of going better is what, I, what I'm going to show today, uh, how you can customize the keyboard we are providing. So even Mohamed just told you the uh, details of architecture, but here's again a quick look of the uh, high level plan. We have a keyboard which is providing the, all the text input for all the applications. It's owned by one single process, the input method server, and it's shared by all user applications in the machine. So whenever an application is active and has input focus, that application gets the input from the virtual keyboard. Here we have the client server interface Mohamed just mentioned. And here is the default virtual keyboard that, that we provide. It looks great. I mean, it's clean, it's clear, it's functional. It shows everything you need. It's familiar, everybody knows how to operate it. It has good contrast, it works in very different lighting conditions. You can, you can use it in bright daylight, in night, everything you can think of. So it's not just simple and pleasuring to the eye, but it's well thought of. It's almost, almost like the architecture of the 30s when, when people created those large, simple lines that are meant for being easy to use. Well, this is just one, of, one view of our default keyboard. We also have support for different input modes for different types of content. The previous was the general mode. Here's the mode that you would use when you're making phone calls or entering phone numbers. It has larger buttons, Oops. larger buttons so it's easier to access it even when you're trying to dial the phone in a quick situation. Um, it has these special cycle buttons here, which allows you to enter asterisk, plus sign, pause. Every time you push that button, the entered text um, cycles to the next value. It has these character mnemonics there, which are 
familiar to almost everybody by now when you know this 0800 dial me go numbers. You, you see a number which is partly written in text, so you need a decrypting buttons for that. Okay, that was the phone number keyboard. Here's our number entry mode keyboard. It's designed to be even more simplistic than the previous ones. Here the main, main idea is to make it as small and uninterstive as possible so that the application can be in the main focus. When the user needs to input numbers, he only needs those characters, those buttons there. There are digits, there's the plus minus sign button, and there's a decimal separator, and a correction button, of course. And what else does he need? If, if, he, does, if he needs something else, then the application should use some other input mode. So the point of that mode is to give efficient and small way of entering numbers. But in addition to these modes, we have something nice, uh, the customizable toolbar area. Applica <coughs> application can define own buttons with own uh, icons, own labels, and own actions bound to those buttons. So when application wants to add smiley in this case, there's a button for that. User can access that functionality quickly. And uh, depending on the application's needs, the toolbar area can be customized to fit just those needs. So why would anybody want to change the this perfect creation? Well, one reason is that sometimes vendors want to separate from other vendors. They want to create their own look. For example, if the Coca-Cola company decides to bring up a Mego device, they probably would like to have a red and white keyboard in the, instead of the white and black we have. So they want to have their own colors. Same thing for some orange uh, telephone operator and so on. Then we, these keyboards can be customized to promote some events. We could, for example, create MIGA conference keyboards as a RPM package that you just email to every participant, and they can install it to the, their devices to show that, see, I went there, I was there, or I'm going there. Or, as you might remember, users like to personalize their devices. In the past, Nokia made huge money by creating these phones where you have click on covers. In the end, it seems that Nokia didn't make the money, but all the other click on cover manufacturers made it. But they were a huge success anyway. Because people want to be different than their, their pals. They want to show something else. They want to show who they are. And for this, we support this personalization. User can make the keyboard look like him or her. For example, the Family princess can set up a pink and fluffy keyboard. Or the girls in the family can make it look uh, dark and mysterious. <clears throat> so, there are a number of reasons people would like to change the appearance of their keyboard. It's possible that somebody would like to always carry their pictures of their loved ones with them. So this is a perfect place to put them on the keyboard. Whenever you want to enter something, you see the important family members also. And of course, the most important reason to do this theming is because you can. We have made it mm, very easy, uh, very um, appealing even to make these changes. So it's going to be quick learn. Uh, the learning curve is going to be very small and it's going to be very fast for you or for everybody to start making their own keyboard packages. The quickest way to modify the appearance is to modify the style of the keyboard. For this, we have the CSS files. They have the familiar syntax most people have already met when they are working with web pages. 
they can be easily edited, edited with your favorite text editor. You don't need any special tools to modify those, just the text editor. Type the uh, mod modifications you want and you're set to go. And even with the, these simple tools, you can already change a lot of the keyboard appearance. You can change how the colors are, are there, what kind of background image does the keyboard have, what are the button sizes and the spacings, even some timings. There's a feature called long press that you can bind, bind to some actions and the values for those timings are defined in CSS. What the CSS doesn't uh, affect is the contents of the keyboard. Just like in the ex, uh, web pages, the CSS only defines the uh, style, not the contents. But when you define this style, you only do need to define it in one CSS file and it's already in effect in all the keyboard modes I showed you. The same Coca-Cola style instantly in all the keyboard input modes. Red and white number, numeric input key, keyboard. So how to, do, how to do the changes? You just launch some uh, favorite text editor you like, love, you're uh, comfortable working with. Open a CSS file. We have this libmeco keyboard CSS and change the values you're interested in modifying. There's a background image file, or file name you have, can insert here. There are some font definitions, uh, the font color, opacity, what kind of paddings there are in the keyboard area or in the button areas, what's the spacing between buttons, and so on and so on and so on. It's a pretty large file. There are many interesting places to look in there. Just open the file from our tutorials and look into it. But when you do these modifications, you get very uh, quick results. It's actually really too easy. For, okay. Yes, but that, that's not possible with just the CSS. I will show it that way also. That's the second step. The first step is making the style to be like you, which is in this case, my, I played around with about one hour with the CSS. Most of the time when I spent by look trying to find a good background image. <laughs> so the the files are really simple to use. The results are really nice. In this case, I changed toolbar, toolbar color, the spacing between buttons because I wanted the buttons be more clearly separate. I changed the background image, the text color and buttons, and all this in less than an hour. With some gifts in graphic design, I'm pretty sure somebody would create good looking keyboards in one evening. Okay, but that's, that was only for the layout. I mean, only for the styling. Sometimes user wants to have a different layout. For that, CSS files are not enough. For that, you have to alter the uh, contents of the keyboard. And the contents of the keyboard or the layout we have stored in an XML file or a set of XML files that are freely editable or even it's even possible to install additional layouts to the device. Again, we've chosen XML because it, the format is well defined. It's familiar to people. You don't need any extra tools for that, or if you do, there already are a lot of uh, XML editors out there. For me, the XML editor was the same. 
here you can see the main elements of our uh, layout XML. We have the keyboard item which contains layouts. Layouts contain some sections. Sections contain rows and rows contain either spacers or keys. In the finally the keys contain bindings. So when you press a key that action creates a binding. If you don't if you have a uh, shift modifier enabled the binding will the binding that will be launched is different than if you didn't have shift modifier. So this is pretty self explanatory file format. It allows you to enter normal characters or these HTML entities in there. And again, less than an hour work, most of it spent doing Googling. And here we have a fully working Dvorak layout. The biggest time was to find a good Dvorak layout example from somewhere and then move those items around in the keyboard definition. Now, I didn't need any kind of compilers or coding in there unless you count XML writing as coding. And still, I managed to create a uh, keyboard that could be claimed as good looking or at least personal. But sometimes that's not what you want to do. Sometimes you want to do even more. Sometimes you want to add functionality that is not in the default keyboard. You want to have handwriting recognition, you want to have dictation, or you are a really hardcore geek and you only want to input binary numbers, entering those eight switches there and pushing them in correct orders. Or maybe you have a barcode reader that you want to use as an input method. For those purposes, you could write your own keyboard plugin. Just as Mohammed uh, explained, our keyboard is just a plugin for the input method server process. Just similarly, you can write your own input method plugin. The only tools you actually need for that are C++ and Qt. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's no additional classes in the interface right now. And when you make your plugin, it will take a little work, maybe a few weeks to make it actually working, just as it should. That's a, the interface is pretty, pretty large and you have to uh, uh, deal with all the corner cases in there. But when, it, you, when you have finished it, when you have installed it, it's available to every cute application, every Migo application in the device. So they will see it as a normal uh, text input source. Your web browser, for, for example, can use that barcode reader when you are entering, paying bills online. The basic classes in this plugin architecture are actually only three classes in the plugin side. In the, in the plugin side, there's this master or main class M input method plugin, which is responsible for identifying the plugin file uh, load and loading the user interfaces from there. This input method plugin is insta instantiated by input method servers plugin manager when server process starts, it scans the plugin folder for all libraries, tries to find these input method plugins in those libraries, and calls their uh, APIs in order to find out what kind of plugin there is. If it finds a suitable plugin for some use case, then it asks that uh, plugin class 
to create the actual input method, which is the keyboard. And the input method should be derived by abstract input method class, which then is responsible for communicating with the user, transmitting all the user interactions to uh, abstract input method host, which is again in the uh, host process UI or input method server. And to provide settings user interface for your plugin, you have to imp implement a uh, settings class. So those are the three basic classes you have to implement. For those, the API is in the tutorials. And, okay. and, and for those, it's, mm, it will take maybe a couple of weeks to create a plugin that's functional. Okay, I, I made a barely functional plugin in a couple of days, but I only uh, implemented a set of those interfaces. It doesn't, for example, support the orientation changes and so on. But now the summary. We have uh, created a great, good-looking, functional keyboard that is perfect already in the box. But sometimes you want to make modifications to it. You want to make it look different. And for that, we have provided you three easy or manageable ways of doing it. There's CSS, which th that is really too easy. Then is XML fi files for layouts. And then there are plugins for the true hackers. And just as a fi final note, if I just manage to uh, go to there. Thanks. Here. Everybody can participate. We are welcoming all contributions, any kind of contributions, suggestions for new features, bug fixes, documentation improvements. You know the Finnish English we use in Nokia. It's not always that perfect. So any kind of proofreading, please submit it to us. The code, the existing documentation, everything is now in Jitorius. We also monitor the mailing lists, and even emailing to me or Muhammad is always welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, we don't have too long for questions. Should we just take one or two? I mean, it seems a shame to come and not have two questions, so. Okay, any questions? Uh, any support for sound feedback, either in your Slack, in the startup keyboard, or in uh, the framework? Because Microsoft recently they had, had a research on sound feedback and this is that, and they actually use it in their tools for sound. Uh, sound feedback in support for the keyboard. I think this is more like an architecture question, so I'll hand it over to our architect. Yes, we have, uh, it's called Feedback Framework. It handles sound, it handles haptic feedback, it handles LEDs. So if you want to, 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 to give feedbacks on the key presses, you will have it. Okay, more questions? We have had uh, lots of discussions of that kind of improvements. We actually have some kind of uh, reactive area uh, adaptation in there. So 
the reactive area is not just the key button area, but it's kind of there's kind of gravity towards the buttons. And the more sophisticated input methods are most I think they are best implemented as additional plugins instead of modifying the existing keyboard. But of course, if you can uh, create a good patch for us to implement them in the keyboard, please do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Another big hand, come on, these heroes of the modern world. Excellent, so we have a media optimization of some sort here at 4.30 and a break until then. So see you then. <laughs>